children of the night. What music they make. Hello, I'm Carla Lemley. When my uncle, Carl Lemley, founded Universal Pictures in 1915, one of the first properties he considered for production as a silent film was Bram Stoker's horror classic, Dracula. 16 years later, when Universal finally produced the film, I had the privilege of speaking the first lines of dialogue in the first talking supernatural thriller. Among the rugged peaks that frown down upon the Borgo Pass are found crumbling castles of a bygone age. <laughs> it was a very small part, but the fact that I still receive fan mail from all over the world is a wonderful testimonial to the film's status as an enduring classic. Join me now as we return to the fog-shrouded Bargo Pass and take a ride together along the road to Dracula. And just as I was commencing to get drowsy, it seemed the whole room was filled with mist. And then I saw two red eyes staring at me and a white, livid face came down out of the mist. I felt its breath on my face. And then its lips. Why are we scared by something? Why are we aroused by something? I'm talking about sexually aroused. Um, because in the case of Dracula, very often the two, th the two responses overlap. Dead. Undead. I don't care. They all frighten me. Oh, I love to be frightened. Do you? Love all you like. I think he's fascinating. Who wouldn't want to be like Dracula? You, you live forever, you don't work, you stay up all night. Dracula is quite simply the most media-friendly fictional personality of the 20th century, if not all time. Even people who've never read the book or have never seen the movie still know exactly who he is. I am Dracula. Count Dracula? Dracula? Oh, what? What's he done to you today? Dracula is our vampire. Dracula? I never even heard the name before. Today, thanks to Universal Studios, everyone knows the name of Dracula. Although at first, my uncle, Carl Emley, had serious reservations about horror movies, Universal eventually filmed Bram Stoker's classic three times first in Todd Browning's famous 1931 film starring Bela Lugosi. Next was the simultaneously produced Spanish language version starring Lupita Tovar and Carlos Villarias. Some people feel that this was the superior version from a technical standpoint, but you'll have to be the judge. And then came the romantic 1979 remake with Frank Langella, I can't imagine how my uncle, a very proper man, would have reacted to such a sexy Dracula. But speaking for myself, I would have given anything for a bit part in that production. The story of Dracula didn't begin at Universal City. As a fictional character, Dracula is more than a hundred years old. First published in 1897, Bram Stoker's original novel has been frightening readers ever since. His centennial was recently celebrated in high style at events, exhibitions, and conventions all over the world. But perhaps the most revealing exhibition took place at the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia, where novelist Bram Stoker's original working notes for Dracula were placed on public display for the first time. What we have here at the Rosenbach are Stoker's working notes for Dracula. His earliest notes concern certain elements of plot. Uh, there are particular scenes in the novel that Stoker had imagined at its earliest stages that survive all the way to the end. Uh, a scene where Jonathan Harker, trapped in Dracula's castle, is preyed upon by three female vampires who are then interrupted by Count Dracula barging into the room, saying, this man is mine, I want him. This was one of Stoker's earliest ideas for Dracula. Bram Stoker never visited Transylvania, but he was very well acquainted with the picturesque town of Whitby on the North Yorkshire coast where a good deal of his novel takes place. 
Stoker often vacationed there and was most impressed with its ancient wind-blown cemetery and crumbling Gothic abbey. Whitby is certainly a wonderful place for atmosphere. It uh, would lend itself to a cinematic treatment if we could imagine Stoker thinking of that. Whitby as a, as a popular port uh, and as a popular sort of shipping port um, had its number of shipwrecks. And Stoker must have been fascinated with the idea of having a shipwreck in Dracula. So he used the shipwreck of a Russian schooner called Dmitri as a model for um, Dracula's arrival onto the English coast. It was in Whitby that Stoker first came across the name of Dracula. He discovered that there was this 15th century Transylvanian prince whose name was Dracula, also known as Vlad the Impaler due to a, a method of disposing of his enemies of which he was particularly fond. If you can see behind me, this is from a, uh, again, late 15th century woodcut of showing Vlad at lunch with some of his victims behind him. Stoker was the first to take the legend of Vlad the Impaler, or Vlad Dracula, and attach it to the vampire and they haven't really come apart since. The historical Dracula didn't inspire Stoker to write the book. There's some confusion about this. He'd already outlined the novel when he came across the account of Vlad the Impaler and simply used it as a kind of window dressing or atmosphere. Stoker's novel unfolds through letters, diaries, and journals. Count Dracula, a 500-year-old vampire, leaves his castle in Transylvania in search of new blood in a new country. Carrying the boxes of native soil in which he must rest during the hours of daylight, Dracula kills the entire crew of the ship that transports him to England. Two young women, Lucy and Mina, become his victims in turn. Dracula kills Lucy, transforming her into a foul thing of the night, an undead creature like himself. Soon, Mina falls under Dracula's spell and is terribly endangered. But thanks to a scientist wise enough to believe in the supernatural, the vampire is finally destroyed and Mina is released from her thrall. Stoker drew on an already established tradition of the vampire in literature and in folklore, but did it in such a way that the legend really achieved a critical mass. Unlike the earlier fictional vampires, Stoker's Dracula was not a romantic character. He was a decrepit old man who became younger as he drank blood, but he never really became attractive. He was writing a, um, a blood and thunder um, a piece of, I suppose, what we would now call sort of exploitation. It's a, it's, it's a first-rate 19th century trashy novel. Above everything, Bram Stoker wanted his story dramatized. He may have been a bit of a frustrated playwright. Stoker's real career was managing London's prestigious Lyceum Theatre, and he knew exactly whom he wanted to play Dracula on stage. His employer, the great Victorian actor, Sir Henry Irving. Well, Henry Irving has a lot to do with the character of Dracula. Um, in the first place, a lot of the characters Henry Irving was most famous for playing could be considered to be Dracula-like characters. Um, roles like Mephistopheles in Faust or Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. These were Henry Irving's greatest roles or the ones for which he was most popular. Psychologically complex villains. Irving would have been perfect for the part. After all, he already was a boss from hell. Irving really was a vampire and he really was a kind of horrible person who fed on the energy of others. They did an interminably long reading of the novel at the Lyceum for purposes of copyright, and Irving was reputed to have walked through the theater and intoned, dreadful, and walked out. Um, and that was stupid of him. It would, it would have been a very good part, and he should have done it, and now Dracula's more famous than he is. Bram Stoker died in 1912 and never saw his story properly dramatized. But nine years later, the character of Dracula made his first screen appearance in a now lost Hungarian film called Dracula's Death. The plot owned almost nothing to Stoker or his book, but I guess Dracula's movie career had to start somewhere. In the story, Dracula plays a music teacher who uh, has gone crazy and then is after some of the patients in the, in the asylum. So 
the story plays more like uh, a Phantom of the Opera than, than Dracula. But however, there is this um, idea of, of a monster loose with uh, bangs and a cape. The following year, German filmmakers got on the Dracula bandwagon with Nosferatu, a symphony of horror. It remains one of the most frightening movies ever made, a classic example of German expressionism. It's so frightening. Well, for one thing, Dracula is so evil, he's disgusting, and he's a plague spreader. Um, and he looks like a rat. There's nothing suave about him. The Dracula character was called Count Orlock and was played by a German stage actor named Max Schreck, whose name, by uh, happy coincidence, uh, means terror or fright in German. And it was his real name. It wasn't just a publicity stunt for the film. And he remains to this day the single screen Dracula who really embodies the essential repulsiveness that Stoker intended. In the early part of the century, the laws of copyright were, were not well um, understood, especially with filmmaking. And Prana Films, which was the very small studio that uh, made Nosferatu, uh, did not either bother or know to get a copyright from uh, Bram Stoker's widow. Murnau used the novel without clearing the rights, and in fact eventually got involved in a big lawsuit, and the film had to be uh, literally pulled from the market. With two movies already to his credit, Dracula decided to give the theater another try. In 1924, the British actor-manager Hamilton Dean added the first authorized dramatization of Dracula to his popular traveling repertory. Film historian and former actor Ivan Butler was a member of Dean's company. He had to cut it down for expense, for one thing, uh, and it's, it's such a vast, rambling novel. It was a sort of um, skeleton of the, of the uh, original. It was Hamilton Dean who really created the modern image of Dracula, and he took his inspiration not from Henry Irving's Shakespearean villains, but from a much lower end of the theater. And essentially, his Dracula is a kind of um, vaudeville or music hall magician, you know, the suave trickster in evening clothes who knows how to work a crowd. When they came to London, of course, uh, and the dreadful notices they had, as we all know, uh, they were very depressed. And uh, somebody came up to him and said, well, what are you worrying about? Have you looked outside? And there was halfway around the, the block queuing for it. Several actors performed the role of Dracula for Dean, including Raymond Huntley, who played the part thousands of times in England and America, and still holds the all-time record for sheer number of performances. Ivan Butler worked with the noted actor W.E. Holloway. He was an older man, you see, very, very gaunt looking, very uh, deep set eyes and everything, and a good uh, voice, and it seemed to, to work better, more like the real Dracula in a way, but he always seemed to me to have something that the young ones lacked. There was no sort of sex attraction. In those days, Dracula came for one thing only, his, his, his evening drink. We had the bat coming in to the uh, window, French window, as you see, at the end of the second act. It was a big scene. The assistant stage manager was standing on a stool um, with a fishing rod, a big long fishing rod, and, and about two foot of bat. And he, she was floating it around outside, like that. And it banged into the window, and smoke came and everything. Uh, and uh, that, then Dracula appeared out of the mist. One day, I don't know why, but the, the uh, string attached to the bat, of the fishing rod, broke. And the bat sailed through the window, right through the window, right across the stage, and floated down and landed in the, in the floats, the two green eyes. <laughs> the outside. And then, of course, Dracula himself had to appear. It must have been difficult to explain. I think some possibly a rather bewildered audience would, well, are there two bats or two Draculas? The stage production was corny, but it was a crowd pleaser, and it was full of startling special effects and loud noises and flash bombs and swirling fog and, and a uh, trick coffin for Dracula that was essentially a, uh, a magician's disappearing cabinet. Dracula got in 
and there was a false bottom under the boards. He would pull the string and the boards would open like that. Dracula would fall down into the base of the coffin and the fuller's earth would all fly out into smoke like that and it would look as if he disappeared into dust. Given Dracula's success in London, it was only a matter of time before Broadway beckoned. The producer Horace Livwright wanted changes and hired the playwright journalist John L. Balderston to improve the product. One day, uh, Horace Livwright, who was a New York producer, was taken to see Dracula. But he, had, uh, he was concerned over the, the Britishness of the language and a lot of idiomatic stuff that would, nobody in New York would understand. So he asked my father if he would uh, rewrite it. In the 1920s, the only kind of vampires American audiences knew about were vamps like Theta Bera. For the Broadway version of Dracula, Horace Livwright wanted a male vamp, an exotic foreigner with an air of mystery and sex appeal. The budget was pretty tight, and they had cast all the parts except for the count, and they were out of money. So they couldn't hire a name actor to do the count. Live right, he found exactly what he was looking for in an expatriate Hungarian actor named Bela Lugosi. Bela Lugosi was an expatriate from Hungary um, who was escaping uh, all kinds of political unrest in his native land and actually landed in New Orleans uh, completely without any skills in English at all, made his way to New York, learning many of his early parts phonetically, amazingly. So when uh, they were casting around for the perfect person to play Dracula, Lugosi managed to have both the old world charm and a certain mysterious seductive quality. He had that thick accent, he had the eyes, he had a series of gestures which to us now look rather hokey. But there are, you know, women fainted and, and, and grown men uh, grew nervous. Well, my father's performance in Dracula uh, brought him to the attention of, uh, in particular, the female portion of the audience. They loved his performance, um, and they must have found uh, something of uh, sexual overtones in it, and he became an idol. The very night Dracula opened on Broadway, Universal had a representative in the audience. As I mentioned earlier, Carl Lemley wasn't a big fan of horror pictures, even though Universal had made a fortune on films like Lon Chaney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera. It was my cousin, Carl Lemley Jr., who really wanted to produce Dracula. Like me, he had grown up with the opportunity to actually watch Lon Chaney filming his famous horror roles for Universal. He loved creepy stories and everything macabre. And Lon Chaney was his first choice to play Dracula. You know, I have no idea what Chaney would have done if he played Dracula uh, makeup-wise. I'm sure he would have done, he, uh, he, I'm sure Chaney would have had much more elaborate makeup. He, he was into the makeup aspect of it. He was in, you know, the man of a thousand faces. He was always changing his look. I don't think he would have just gone with the light makeup with the dark lips. You know, he, uh, in the case of, of uh, London After Midnight, he did these, you know, all these pointy teeth and this permanent grin and these pulled down eyelids, which I think is a classic makeup. Um, I, I have no clue. I would love to see what Cheney's version of Dracula would have been. Cheney died of cancer in 1930 and a number of other actors were considered other than Bela Lugosi. My father, uh, was, to his great surprise, was not the first choice uh, when the Universal Studios began casting for the lead in the motion picture version of Dracula, even though my father had uh, successfully played the part hundreds of times on Broadway and throughout the United States. And actually, he had to fight for the role. Next to Bela Lugosi, the film's most memorable performer was Dwight Fry as the unfortunate Mr. Renfield. He was such a gentleman when I fell into his lap in the opening scene. You'd never dream he'd end up eating spiders and developing an appetite for even worse. Rats, rats, thousands, millions of them. I don't really think he was surprised by the roles he, he, 
began to play when he got to Hollywood because he'd had such a variety of roles in New York on Broadway, from comedy to musicals to serious drama to crooks and all kinds of characters. By the time he was 30, he was an experienced character actor. Renfield is probably the most multifaceted character in the film. I mean, he's, he's sane at times, he's mad at times, he's vampirish at times. Also on hand from the Broadway production was Edward Van Sloan, repeating the role of Professor Van Helsing. Here's part of his screen test. I was looking in the mirror. Its reflection covers the whole room. But I cannot see you. Dracula was directed by Todd Browning, the famous mystery man of silent movies who had directed many of Lon Chaney's most successful films. Browning always had some trouble adapting his kind of style of shooting to the sound film. Um, when you see Browning work with Dracula, for example, uh, there are long sequences in the film which are silent. Um, and I think that Browning uses some of the silence to, to create a mood, which in, in some areas of Dracula is quite effective. It may have been that he was frightened by dealing with dialogue. It may have been that he was frightened by the mechanics of the sound equipment. Todd Browning had been a very successful silent film director, and he always specialized in stories about outsiders. Dracula is very much like that. He's a fantastic alien invader who cannot live within the world, but can only prey upon it like a parasite. And Dracula may be the ultimate Todd Browning outsider, and so it's not surprising that Dracula was Browning's most successful film. In terms of responsibility for a visual style of Dracula, uh, we know, of course, uh, the cameraman, Carl Freund, was behind the camera, the great German uh, photographer who pioneered so much moving camera in Germany in the late 20s. And it's very easy for people to say, well, any value in Dracula is due to Freund, who was a great cameraman. And, and uh, there's the anecdotal uh, report of uh, one of the actors, David Manners, who couldn't remember uh, Browning's presence on the set well, but did recall Freund as being very outspoken. The beginning of Dracula uses a lot of uh, mobile camera setups. We have some tracking shots, uh, and we have a, a feeling that we're almost watching a German expressionist film that has come over to Hollywood. These tracking shots uh, give us a feeling like we're being um, pushed against our will to go to different areas of the castle. They're all things like uh, broken down, withered mansions with huge cobwebs. And for some reason, no one's ever quite understood armadillos running around and bats floating overhead. In fact, Browning uh, and the Universal Dracula are you know, sort of responsible for almost all the iconography that we associate with horror films. Uh, long capes, sweeping staircases, mold and decay, lots of cobwebs, spiders and bats. I mean, everything that now has become the sort of Saturday morning thing that kids associate with horror films all comes from, from Dracula. Originally, Dracula had been planned as a lavish, big-budget production that would have been based primarily on Stoker's novel. But in the wake of the stock market crash and the onset of the Great Depression, uh, the studio really had to cut back. And they ended up basing the film largely on the stage play uh, for simple reasons of economy. Today, it may seem difficult to imagine audiences really being frightened by a film like Dracula, but they really were. It was the first time Hollywood had presented this kind of a supernatural story that didn't have a logical explanation tacked on at the end. And audiences were really creeped out by this atmosphere of weird decadence. They'd never seen anything like it. Among other things, there were a lot of theaters in, in different parts of the world that were still not equipped with uh, sound equipment for the audiences to hear the movie. And as a result, uh, sound films like Dracula were released in silent versions so that, so that those audiences, those theaters that weren't equipped with sound equipment could actually see the film. That was another way of getting over language barriers in the early talking era. The adoption of English-speaking talkies posed a real problem for the Latin American markets, which wanted to hear talking films spoken in their own language. Dubbing was still not an efficient and known commodity, and those studios that had the biggest interest in that market turned to doing secondary productions of their major films in Spanish versions for that market. Dracula was one of these pictures.
Soy Drácula. No podía usted ser más oportuno. No sé lo que pasaría con el cochero, con mi equipaje. Con todas esas cosas, creí que me había equivocado de casa. The Spanish version of Dracula, directed by George Melford, was produced by Paul Conner, an ambitious young protege of my uncle. His overall enthusiasm for the film may have had something to do with his feelings for his leading lady, the beautiful Mexican ingenue, Lupita Tovar. So the cast for the English version would come in the morning, at started shooting at 8 o'clock, and the Spanish cast will come in the evening. We shot all night long till next morning, because we use exactly the same the same sets. Apparently what happened was that the uh, initial crew, Browning's crew, would shoot these sequences. Um, the, the second crew, the Spanish crew, would look at them and say to themselves, we can do better than that. And they would go and they would do better. Something so incredible. I mistrust my own judgment. Mire. Well, I don't think anybody's going to give any acting awards to Carlos Villarías. But overall, the Spanish film is a real delight for film buffs because it's kind of like discovering all these fascinating new rooms in a familiar old house. And it's full of these wonderful optical effects and visuals that really seem ahead of their time. What we do see in the Spanish version is, among other things, a, a much more artistic, a much more innovative use of camera movement in those early talkies, and that's not what we get in the Lugosi version at all. The, the camera movements are far more fluid, there's far more of them. It's, it's a more lively film to watch unfold before your eyes than the Lugosi film. One only wishes that Lugosi had been directed uh, in, a, in like fashion as the Spanish version. Dracula did sensational box office the result in part of Universal's atmospheric and imaginative promotion. One of the most inventive designs of posters was Lugosi, arms upraised, clawing at the air behind a spider web in which various heads of his female victims uh, were ensnared in the strands of the web like some sort of bizarre insects. So you had a, a whole bunch of different poster designs that sought to emphasize both the mystery and the sexual, underlying sexual content of this film. It was a very unique film in that sense. Children are, are another category that, that found strong interest in Dracula. There, there was even a group of sociologists that studied movie responses to the various films of the early 30s, and often children would mention among their favorite movies, ones they liked to act out at home, was Dracula. I remember uh, early on being taken to other movies that he had m made uh, with some of my friends and classmates and whatnot, and they would always be frightened and hide behind the, the seats in the theater. And I would never be frightened because that was my father. That's who I'd see. But uh, uh, I remember when I was very young, I would, uh, I would try to imitate my father as Dracula, and I have some home movies that, that show that. So he showed me uh, uh, how he did it. Certainly more than any other performer, Bela Lugosi showed the world for all time how a vampire was supposed to look, how a vampire was supposed to act, and how a vampire was supposed to talk. I have chartered a ship to take us to England. We will be leaving tomorrow evening. I don't think Lugosi's face was as fascinating as Karloff's. In fact, I think Karloff probably would have made a good Dracula as well. But, but you know, that whole Hungarian accent and, 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 and the way that he spoke and, and, and the weird rhythm of his speech and everything, I think is what people remember about Dracula. He felt very strongly that he, in Dracula he had created a character that was quite different and far more powerful than the way he's described in Bram Stoker's novel and that thereafter he would always be regarded as the Dracula, and Dracula and Bela Lugosi would become synonymous. Lugosi had a magic all his own. He was the kind of uh, man who, when he walked into a room, even if it was a crowded room and nobody knew who he was, everybody would look and stare and turn around and say, well, who is that? He had that kind of a personality. And especially in the horror film, where, where characters can be so larger than life. Lugosi probably 
uh, seems to be about the darkest personality, the larger than life personality beyond any others I know of in the horror film, possibly in the cinema at large. Many fine actors have played Dracula in recent years and almost all of them play against the Lugosi characterization. But uh, paradoxically, and I guess inevitably, they end up only bringing Lugosi to mind because somehow we can't help but make that comparison in our minds. Because of the success of the motion picture Dracula, he became so associated with that part that a lot of people regard him as Dracula, even though Dracula is a fictional person. And it changed his life. Uh, he was pretty much typecast after that. And when interviewed, uh, he would say that Dracula is a blessing and a curse and Dracula never dies. And really that's what happened and he carried that role to his death. And I think going back and seeing these films is like a mini time capsule. It's also that way with collectors. We grew up loving these films. We weren't there on the set in 1931, but we want to be there so very much that we watch these films over and over. We wish to own a prop from them or perhaps own a poster from them. If there is a holy grail of Dracula collectibles, the Transylvanian Shroud of Turin, it would have to be Bela Lugosi's original Dracula cape. My father had several different uh, capes. Uh, some were heavier material, some were lighter, depending upon uh, you know, where he was going to use it. Uh, I had one cape left, and uh, my mother told me that this was the cape that he had worn in the motion picture Dracula. And I've had it independently verified that that is from the film. So it is one of America's rarest pieces of film history, and I, I really treasure it. My mother and myself uh, had him buried in one of his capes. Not that, he, not that he had ever expressed that wish, but we thought it would be appropriate. Most all modern audiences ha haven't always seen Dracula, but uh, certainly not the universal version with Lugosi. That's the image we carry of Dracula, of vampires. It's Universal's Dracula. It's Bela Lugosi. Dracula has become one of the great media superstars of all time. Uh, there's a line from Macbeth, a play that Bram Stoker was very familiar with. And yet, who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? When Dracula was first released, it was accompanied by a final curtain speech read by the character of Professor Van Helsing. If memory serves, the good professor held up his hand and said, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, just a word before you go. We hope the memories of Dracula won't give you bad dreams, so just a word of reassurance. When you get home tonight and the lights are turned out and you're afraid to look behind the curtains and you dread to see a face appear at the window, well, just pull yourself together and remember, after all, there are such things. There are such things. There are such things.